like to quickly thank you all for the tremendous honor of standing on this distinguished stage. I have attended um, all the past keynotes and it's amazing for me to be able to um, be speaking to you on the same stage. And I'm incredibly honored as well to be speaking to an audience like you. Um, I first grew familiar with education service agencies through my work, video conferencing with students presenting about reading and writing. And these video conference sessions were often arranged by local ESAs. And it's a great honor to see you, some of whom I've only met before over the phone or over video conferencing, and actually see your faces in person. I also want to have a special shout out to thank the wonderful people from Washington State ESAs. Um, stand up and cheer if you're from Washington. Yay! All of you who feel left out, it's okay. You can move here. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, and I, I was actually one of the reasons that I first became familiar with the AESA organization was when I was on a panel um, at a Seattle conference for Washington State ESAs, and Dr. Monty Bridges actually moderated that panel, so I was super happy to see him give the much. Uh, deserved Justice Eve Prentice Award yesterday. Now it's not all about Washington though. I also want to thank the incredible speakers I've learned so much from over the past couple of days from all over the world, and especially the people of SDAC, the Educational Services and Staff Development Association of Central Kansas. <laughs> Lovely acronym you have there, by the way. And you made me want to go to Kansas more than ever. I'll brave the tornadoes. <laughs> the amazing things that you're doing. And so if you visited yesterday's Digital Jam, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, I came to the conference with a few different ideas of things that I wanted to share. And whenever people ask me, what are you going to be talking about? I had a few different answers. I would say technology, I would say youth voice. But one of the things I would like to start with is the everyday experience um, that I see as a student going to school. Now, if you're wondering what qualifications I have to be standing on this stage, I could run off a list of um, you know, the conferences I presented at or the books I've written, but I'd like to think that one of my foremost qualifications is being a student and having that experience of um, sitting in the chair every day and seeing what goes on. So I want to quickly show you what I have in my backpack. This is essentially my online binder. It's where I store my assignments, um, my work that I do, my online classes, and this is my physical binder that I have for my local brick and mortar school. A bit heavier, a little bit more worn looking, and um, you can see that there's quite a lot of paper in here. Actually, I should probably zip it up before stuff falls out. So there's my physical um, binder for storing my schoolwork. Now just think back to all the paper that you carried around when you were in school. Maybe it was a comparable amount to that, maybe more, maybe less. Well, things haven't changed one bit, because even though now students are typing up most of our assignments and using web sources for our research, our teachers still expect printed out copies, centered title and 12 point font for um, most of our assignments stapled to the back of the assignment sheet. And I and many other students like me wonder why. Why not just upload it to a free shared Dropbox folder, allowing the teacher to get it instantly, grade it quickly, and create an online portfolio so that our parents can see what we're doing in school, instead of always having to bring back big names of paper. And this is all possible with the tools that we have available that are easily available to most students um, and, or schools, computers and internet. But overuse of printing and perhaps underuse of some of the more modern tools we have available isn't a problem based on um, affluence or access because my school district is in the shadow of Microsoft. It's a very wealthy school district and I've even visited some Title I schools that have equipment that is gathering dust. In my local school, there's an interactive whiteboard in every classroom and there are computers lining the walls. But we use the computers pretty rarely and the interactive whiteboards are kind of ironically covered in posters. We're filling out worksheets and taking lots and lots of loose leaf notes um, while those tools go unused. And I find it ironic that this school, which is um, training a lot of the students who are sons and daughters of employees in Microsoft, curiously enough, is um, very 19th century in some of its approaches. I'm not advocating that we suddenly ban printing any assignments or using pencils and paper, but our schools, classrooms, and curriculums need to balance 
the binder filling paper world of our teachers with the online technological world of our students by meaningfully and purposefully using technology in school, ultimately achieving the theme of this conference, to rethink, redesign, recreate. Great examples of such projects that balance the traditional and digital, or to borrow a phrase from Kevin Honeycutt, for digital, come from Kansas's SDAC's life practice challenges. Some of you um, might have seen some of these. Um, where you see emphasis on both traditional competencies, there's research, there's science, social studies, math, reading, writing, as well as online skills. These are projects where hands-on means virtual, as students are both constructing things, writing things down, as well as researching and creating with the web. But you might ask, this seems like a lot of trouble to go to to achieve basically the same goals that we could get across in a lecture. How are we going to tell teachers we need to do project-based learning? Um, what is the reason for that? Well, to answer that question, I'd ask another kind of longer question. What is the image you would most likely see walking through an average school hallway and looking through the windows? Do you see image number one? Biology students busy at work manipulating a 3D model of an animal cell um, on an iPad with their fingers, or even better yet, creating a 3D model of an animal cell on Google SketchUp and letting other people download it, not just taking, but making. Do you see students playing a realistic simulation game, such as Food Force, the first humanitarian video game from the World Food Program, to gain a deeper understanding of the global humanitarian issue, then write blog posts to spread awareness and make their friends um, aware of an important issue and then get evaluated through peer comments? Or do I see image number three? Students hunched over their desks, pencils in hand, bubbling in answers on one of those dreaded long test answer sheets. And to clarify, I'm not against testing itself, but I do think that some of this stuff could be done more effectively um, on a computer. Now what's so strange about the disconnect between images number one and two, and images, um, and image number three, is the fact that I'd argue that it's one and two that prepare students more for real life, not to mention they're closer to what we do at home after school anyway, and yet it's image number three overwhelmingly that I see when I'm walking down hypothetical hallway. The reason I want to see more meaningful projects is because they prepare us more for real life. I had the opportunity to speak briefly with the president of Corwin Press, who shared with me a powerful quote he had read in a book, that today's students need to have the skills of MIT, MTV, and Madison Avenue. We are not going to get these skills from fill-in-the-blank comprehension questions. You see, I'm guessing that most of the problems you've faced in your professional careers in your life have not come with A through E multiple choice answers. Hmm, I'm having a fight with my spouse. A, should I walk out? B, should I? <laughs> Fun to imagine, but I'm guessing that's never happened. Uh, not to say that I'm setting myself up for a lifetime of fights with a spouse, but the problems that we are going to face in our futures are going to be varied and complex. Ones where we'll have to figure stuff out, come up with our own answers to questions, maybe even come up with the questions themselves. And these are the skills we get from analyzing, creating, distributing the skills that are addressed in many different 21st century style projects. These are exactly the type of skills I learned when I organized a youth conference, TEDx Redmond. Um, raise your hand if you're familiar with the TED conference. I see a lot of raised hands. Awesome. Well, for those of you who don't know, TED basically stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. It's a yearly conference. The speeches are posted online, free to the world. They receive millions of views. So the TEDx events are independently organized versions. Now, organizing this conference taught me a great deal. It taught me better persuasive writing skills because, dear Mr. So-and-so, our conference would like to have your money is not going to get you sponsorship. <laughs> so um, fundraising was definitely a great way to learn that. To leading a team, we had um, 16 different teenagers on our committee. Each This was during the summer holiday, so you can imagine coordinating meeting times with family vacations and parents driving. This was, um, you know, crazy amount of work. And these aren't just skills that help make a successful conference, as TEDx Redmond was for the second year of uh, September. They're skills that are important in school and life. Then there's the second part of why I like images number one and two better than three. The being most relevant or close to what we do after school anyway. Have you ever wondered what students do when they walk out of school and go home? 
Maybe you know what your kids or grandkids do. Well, when I get home from school, I turn on my computer. I watch nightly news broadcasts every night at 6, but I don't wait until then to find out what happens. If there's breaking news, I'll see it on CNN.com or on my smartphone or through Twitter. And while our teachers may not let us cite Wikipedia in, our, in a research paper, most of my peers use it for just about everything else. I take AP US History online, and for some reason I felt curious, maybe I was just procrastinating on a paper, but for some reason I felt curious to learn more about the founding father, Governor Morris, no idea if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, um, who was a very influential figure at the Constitutional Convention. And so I just looked him up on Wikipedia, and I was kind of perusing it, and I found this very interesting fact, death and legacy. In 1816, uh, died after sticking a piece of whalebone through his urinary tract to relieve a blockage. That is what I call a life lesson. Um, <laughs> um, not quite. And yes, this is true, I did check the citations. Uh, Wikipedia does back it up with a Yale University page, so I think um, if you don't trust Wikipedia, you can definitely trust Yale. So normally, of course, of course, I went to uh, Facebook to post this interesting tidbit of information to which one history teacher, Jeff Wickersham, commented, truthfully, the A-push test would not touch that question with a 10-foot whalebone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware that Facebook can be at times much maligned by educators and administrators as a distraction and a website that is more antisocial than social. However, it can be used in meaningful ways. Just like any tool, it can help us or it can hurt us. It just depends on how it's used. I mean, Microsoft Word, you can write an angry propaganda pamphlet just as well as you can write a beautiful document um, directing funds to a philanthropic cause. You know, it's a tool. When you think of Facebook, the first thing that jumps to your mind might not be lively discussion around AP classes, but that seems to be more and more what I'm using it for. Noticing that a lot of other AP classes at Redmond High School had their own uh, Facebook group, uh, Redmond High School is where I take my brick and mortar classes, then I thought that it might be a good idea to set one up for my class APR history. So within three hours, most of our class was on the group. I invited six people, they all invited their uh, other classmates, and so we pretty much had everyone in the class on the group in that day. And so we were soon posting, asking and answering questions, um, and on massive assignment deadline weeks, commiserating with our fellow procrastinators. <laughs> And the great thing about it was that um, there were things that were expressed here that might not have come across on a school or adult-run website. We were really uninhibited. We were asking questions um, that we might worry would make us look stupid if we asked the teacher. It was better to get it from our peers sometimes. And this isn't unique to my local area because students are using Facebook for homework help or setting up school groups all around the world. You no longer have to organize a study group in someone's house to study, and I guess this is where some might complain that Facebook is antisocial, but now you can um, just do it online. I use Facebook to talk about APR history or to biology homework for the days I was absent from my classmates. I use YouTube to watch French videos and improve my pronunciation or to review for the PSAT. But I walk into school, and many of these tools that I use to learn are replaced with pencils and printed worksheets. I'm not necessarily against the filters that schools have against YouTube and Facebook, it sounded like that, because I understand that there are obvious concerns you have when you're dealing with thousands of students who may not all have the PSAT in French on their minds. But I do want to say that you're not going to teach a student's digital literacy skills by filtering out every possible thing that could be harmful or not credible. To repeat the oft-used metaphor, it's like never letting a child cross the street until they're 18 and then suddenly, okay, out into the world you go. When you speak to administrators and teachers in professional development sessions regarding internet use, I hope you're able to emphasize that we, don't, that we shouldn't be just taking a short-term approach of let's filter out everything that could possibly be bad. That needs to be partnered with instructing students about digital citizenship, whether through integration of projects or through you know, a seminar or a lesson. But the idea of teaching these skills, which many have termed 21st century skills, um, digital citizenship, web citizenship, can actually be surprising, con surprisingly controversial, however. And I know that some of you in the audience might feel a little fatigued by the number of times you've heard some of those terms. Uh, raise your hand if any of you feel like you could have a break from hearing, I don't know, um, 21st century skills, let's say.
to be honest. Okay, I'm seeing a few raised hands. So I see that some of you um, have gotten a little bit tired of, of the jargon. And indeed, many educators and journalists have questioned, are digital skills really um, valuable? Time Magazine published an opinion piece Digital literacy will never replace the traditional kind. We're overestimating how much computers will teach our kids. And obviously, I was really interested to read this because I'm a huge advocate of meaningfully integrating technology. And so has anyone here read the article? Raise your hand. Not too many people. Um, it basically says that online skills need a strong base of knowledge first. To quote what the article said, there is no doubt that the students of today and the workers of tomorrow will need to innovate, collaborate, and evaluate to name three of the 21st century skills so dear to digital literacy enthusiasts. But such skills can't be separated from the knowledge that gives rise to them. To innovate, you have to know what came before. To collaborate, you have to contribute knowledge to the joint venture. And to evaluate, you have to compare new information against knowledge you've already mastered. Nor is there any reason that these skills must be learned or practiced in the context of technology. I fully agree with the idea that students need a strong knowledge base to complement development of digital skills. But in my experience, you can use your digital skills to develop that knowledge base. And using the internet doesn't mean that you won't read books. Take my story as a case in point. From an early age, I absolutely love to read. You can see this as an example. I'm the one in the middle. Aren't they so cute? <laughs> <laughs> Aw, moment. Um, no, I'm joking. This, uh, that's my big sister, that's my mom. So I really loved reading, uh, reading with my family, reading out loud, reading silently. I would just read everywhere. I started reading chapter books when I was three and a half, and soon I was devouring, um, it could be as many as two books a day. My parents would really have to drag me to dinner to get me away from my favorite books, because who needs food when you feed on words? <laughs> I also watched TV, a lot of TV actually. But my sister and I weren't watching Pokemon or Saturday morning cartoons. Our favorite channel was PBS. We loved watching PBS shows like Between the Lions, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Reading Rainbow, Cyber Chase, um, to name a few. And we might not have realized it while we were having fun watching TV, but we were learning. And I loved using the computer. When I was six, my mom got me my first laptop, and yet again, I was unstoppable. I would type out hundreds of stories. My parents still had to drag me to dinner. Later on, when I started using the internet more, I grew very fond of educational games. The concept that games are only for entertainment or for little kids is one that I really like to get rid of. I, for one, can attest to the fact that I learned so much through the games I played online about science, history, and social issues, NobelPrize.org, United Nations websites, the BBC Schools page. There are an abundance of these free resources that get students engaged and tie in the standards um, and service learning. Many nonprofits have created games that really engage the players, but also teach about the concept that they're trying to um, promote or raise awareness about. Um, I briefly mentioned the World Food Program's uh, humanitarian video game Food Force, for instance. That's where players go through missions, develop a nutritional food packet that is most effective. So you can see that there are different skills being integrated there. And they also have the online trivia game Free Rice, which some of you might know about. And every correct answer uh, gives five grains of rice, no cost to the player. It's all through sponsors. There are an abundance of these current events games that are perfect for, really could be anywhere as young as six, like I was when I would be playing these, or um, up to high school level. And they help to teach these social studies issues like world hunger without coming across as overly dry or overwhelming. Quite honestly, I can credit a lot of my knowledge around ancient Egyptian history to a somewhat gruesome interactive that I played on the BBC Schools page. You can um, read the subtitles to yourself to see what I mean by gruesome. And you go through this quick and drag process of making a mummy. It has lots of interesting texts throughout Egyptian funerary practices and culture along the way, which is way funner than it sounds because you would not believe how susceptible eight-year-old girls are to learning when dragging bodily organs to canopic jars involved. <laughs> I would say the same thing is probably true of eight-year-old boys, um, maybe even more so. So you see how my early education was truly the perfect balance of traditional. I loved reading. Um, I watched TV. I don't know if you consider that traditional modern. It depends on um, how old you are. But I, which is, um, I feel like I can't say anything about age. A lot of people have come up to me and said things like, oh, you're going to be speaking to us old I don't even want to say things, but, you know, and I feel like, well, I'm not going to say that on stage. Um, yeah, that was sort of an obscure reference. But the point is that you can take these traditional skills and the more modern ones, and they don't fight each other. 
they can work together perfectly. I loved using the computer, watching educational programs on TV, but that didn't mean that I wouldn't still uh, devour books. And I still do. In fact, I have a great snapshot of a conversation I had on Facebook a while ago with friends debating over the popular young adult novel series, The Hunger Games, which is being turned into a movie, as some of you know. Um, and we were arguing, uh, this is the pretty much the archetypal Hunger Games argument. We were arguing over which character, Gail or Peta, was superior for any of you who read the books or have teenage kids or grandkids. This might be a familiar argument. We read the books as hard copies. It was a solitary reading experience. But then we take our reading experience, we bring it online, and we're able to have a passionate discussion about books. Wouldn't you like to see students getting really heartfelt and passionate about books that they were reading? It doesn't have to be The Hunger Games. What if it could be um, A Tale of Two Cities? Or, uh, trying to, uh, or um, Hedda Gabler. Okay, that's a play, but still, I'm trying to think of literature. And if you can take the solitary experience of reading and make it social with Facebook, I think that that really goes to show how tools can be used for good. To go back to that controversial article about digital skills in Time Magazine, you might say that I developed my online skills simultaneously along with my knowledge base. And I think that the fact that my parents didn't limit me to one medium or another was one of the most valuable things they could have done. Because by having kids discover new content, knowledge, learning interactions on many different mediums, we'll realize that learning truly does happen anytime, anywhere. It doesn't just happen in the four walls of a classroom. It can happen on a hike with your dad, pointing out various flora and fauna and what type of genus a plant is. It can happen when you're at an amazing conference with a bunch of uh, people who are crucial to education. It can happen when you're on a plane and reading Sky Mall. <laughs> No, this is true. <laughs> and this understanding that learning can happen across mediums is a first step to developing lifelong learners. And that's a phrase I haven't gotten tired of using. I've been incredibly impressed with the courage and open-mindedness that all of you have exhibited here. Just from seeing the number of you at the Digital Jam yesterday, whether it was uh, playing with the Wii, rocking out on the karaoke, um, I know that you are all experimenting with new and innovative tools. I'm especially glad to see this from you because ESAs are really trendsetters for education. Since you're providing PD to teachers, it makes sense for you to all be role models, ambassadors, if you will, for the use of these tools. Monkey see, monkey do, right? Not my colleague, anyone, monkey. That always seems slightly insulting to me, like when you're saying that. Now, one of the main themes of this conference is redesign, um, how we can take something and redesign it. And I wanted to mention a couple of trends I think are going to help do exactly that for education. I've been particularly interested to learn more about the concept of the flipped classroom. Raise your hand if you've heard of the flipped classroom. Okay, I'm seeing a fair number of raised hands, that's great. Well, flipped classrooms are where the homework is to watch the recorded lecture, the teacher's explanation of a concept, and then the classwork is the stuff that would usually be assigned as homework, say a math problem, if it's math, um, or a social studies project. And this allows teachers to spend class time helping each student where they are having issues or getting directly involved in the project, as opposed to using the 55 minutes for direct lecturing. Many teachers use um, things like the Khan Academy to accomplish this model. Um, who here is sort of the Khan Academy? Seeing some raised hands, great. Well, the Khan Academy is based on the work of Salman Khan, who's an ex-hedge fund analyst, decided to quit his job and develop these teaching videos full-time, put them on the web for anyone in the world to see. And uh, today he's made over 2,600 videos which cover topics from math to science to history. And the great thing is that teachers can sign up and can follow the students' progress through it, so it's not just students you know, going home and no one knows if they've watched the videos or not. And when I present to students over video conferencing about topics like writing and social studies, I'll always record the sessions and then post them on my YouTube channel um, where teachers and students can find them free to watch without ads. Flipping the classroom can mean more time in class for students to receive targeted help and for fun stuff like collaborative projects, group discussions, and it's now easier than ever to do because there are so many widely available um, recording tools. I mean, if any of you stop by the TechSmith booth, for instance, you might have seen Camtasia Studio. I think that the flipped classroom model is definitely one that's worth giving a try. I know that many of my peers would probably love to go home with an assignment of watching a video as opposed to do problems 10 through 50. And what about its applications for professional development sessions? 
Could any of you see possibly explaining the concept by a video, sending it to attendees, and then doing hands-on work, the more workshop stuff projects, um, collaboratively during the session? We'll take a minute to discuss your opinion of the flipped classroom model, whether applications in the classroom for professional development, what you think of this, maybe if you're already familiar with it, you can add some insights. Just um, discuss with your table um, your opinion of the flipped classroom model. Wow. I think that I don't know much about what they're saying, but I know what you're talking about. We've done some of that same stuff in my childhood. My, my grandson now is in a, is in a school which never used this term for the classroom, but project based. And um, he's gone from a traditional type of classroom to this magnet school, which is they send up at home. You do your project, that's your homework, you doing your project. And so uh, this child who, is, who uh, came from an earlier came from, from a neglected background. And uh, we've been working on him the last time. We've had him uh, as our school. Okay. As the kid from last so what, what, was the overall, what was the overall feeling about the whole flip costume thing? Do you think promising, not very promising? Any opinions that you'd like to share if you were talking with your table? Um, can you raise your hand and throw out some of the ideas, initial thoughts? Yes? We use it with our career center students because obviously they don't have the tools at home, so they do the classwork at home, and they come do the projects together at the career center. Okay, great. Um, so if, um, for instance, if students don't have the tools at home, then they're able to come to class and do the classwork, and that makes it more effective. Okay, great. So um, that's definitely a good example. When the tools that students would need to do um, classwork are at the school, then that might be um, an area where flip class would definitely be very handy. What are some other ideas, things you've done, um, things you could see yourself doing? If you don't like it, that's also perfectly valid. I'd love to hear any comments. Um, raise your hand if it's promising, if there's promising. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of raised hands. Great. So if you think it's promising, surely you can back that up with how you think uh, where the, that promise might lie. Okay. Yes. Yep, you. Sorry. I'm terrible. My, my daughter just shared that for Matt, that would be absolutely perfect for her. She to be able to go focus you know, on the process. That's great. I'm really glad that you shared that, actually. So we're hearing from a student. Um, Dad just said that for math, that would be absolutely perfect if you could take the teacher's traditional lecture, put it online, and then do the um, traditional homework as classwork. I would really love that for math as well, because um, when you think about math, if you all were in fairly traditional math classrooms, if the teacher stands up in here, we're going to look at how to solve x, y squared plus um, y squared. And, you know, you're working with that. And if you're sitting there and you have something else on your mind, or if the person next to you is being distracting, then okay, the lecture has kind of uh, gone over your head, or if the teacher's going too fast or too slow. Now imagine being able to take that, watch it online, you can um, skip over parts if you really want to, if you know the concept well. Um, or you can pause, you can make sure, you can reinforce your understanding, you can watch it again. And then when you come to class, and you do problems 1 through 50 or however many problems there are, then the teacher is able to actually help you and see where you make mistakes, as opposed to doing the homework, maybe doing a bunch of problems incorrectly and getting that incorrect method in your head. So yeah, I think that's a really good point, that it could be used very well for math. And I think that there are applications in lots of other subjects as well. So that's just an idea about the flip costume. I thought it would be kind of applicable to the redesign part of the conference. Now, over the past 30 years, I know that schools have suffered or benefited from various innovations, various phases of technology development. Some early adopters in education feel that they wasted time and money in bringing in technologies that didn't work as well as they should. For instance, my uncle told me the story of his high school in the 80s in Eugene, Oregon, and they had brought in this beautiful new video conferencing machine. And remember, this is like a long time ago, so this was, I mean, <laughs> Or did I just like reveal my age here? Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, reveal my age. Um, before I was born, anyway. You know, to be honest. Eon. But the, the school bought this video conferencing equipment, and if you can imagine that this is video conferencing, and there are no, practically no contact providers, the bandwidth is horrible because I think it was like over phone lines practically, and um, it was, you know, no existing infrastructure really. So obviously video conferencing was never tried again. And 
I heard this and I thought, well, you know, it's really a shame. I think that there are two lessons to be learned from that story of the, of the failed high school in Eugene trying to bring in this video conferencing machine. The first one is be resilient. We can't expect anything to be perfect all the time. Uh, I was actually at another education conference in Canada. I was trying to show a video. It did not work. I had to jump off the stage and run through the audience to the back where the tech booth was, run back upstage. Did I want that to happen? No. But did I, did it let, did I let that make me fall to the ground and weep? Also, no. Sometimes there are things that are just out of our control. For instance, my local school district um, recently decided to adopt an online communication platform called Communicator uh, this September. They actually worked on it all over the summer. It didn't roll out until many weeks after school. There was a lot of hard work that went into it. And finally, we got the ability to set our password. So everyone had to make a new username, a new password. There was all this reconfiguration. You had to join your teacher's group. It was a lot of trouble. And then, about two weeks after everyone had finally gotten over this initial bump, the British company that made Communicator decided to pull out of the US. So bye bye Communicator. <laughs> it was truly a comedy of errors. But my teacher didn't just give up and decide to never use an online communication device or post in classwork and such. My APR history teacher switched to Edmodo and my biology teacher is setting up Google Sites. So be resilient. The second lesson is the fact that technology has definitely advanced since then in its ease to use because now a lot of products are made more for us the consumers as opposed to the expert or the institution. There's, so there's much um, more ease of use and I think better infrastructure. It's an exciting time because if you ask students what kinds of devices do you have, do you have a smartphone, do you have an iPod, many of the students will probably raise their hands. Individual students are better equipped with consumer devices that can be adapted to education purposes. On my Kindle Fire, I have all these apps for Chinese, for French, for math, um, that I use a lot in my learning. The concept of bringing your own device is gaining momentum in a lot of schools. But some schools may face this challenge and not every student might have a home computer or that their internet access at home is unreliable. Raise your hand if you work with any schools that might face challenges where students don't have access at home seeing a lot of raised hands. So for those of you who work with schools where that, uh, where that is the case, um, then I know that sometimes some of you might have one-to-one -one programs or um, computer loaner programs. How many of you uh, work with schools that have those? Okay, I'm seeing some raised hands. Um, now, definitely this is a huge challenge that has to be overcome when it, because if a student doesn't have you know, computer or internet access at home, how are you going to do something like a flip classroom? Um, you can't assign a video to watch it student doesn't have the ability to watch a video on their computer. So I think that one-to-one -one programs are a great way to address that. Um, I know that that also involves a huge amount of technology funding. So where um, compromises can be made, where schools often have computer labs, such um, you know, if students can stay after school, there are many ways that I know some teachers are really going above and beyond to try to bridge that gap. And then there are schools going even further than, say, a one-to-one -one computer program. They're undertaking blended learning or a cross between online and in-person education. This doesn't just mean that teachers are going to go and post PowerPoints online, um, although you know, that's always nice, but this means that students go on the internet for at least a primary segment of curriculum and then go to their local school, say, one or two days a week, or it could be the reverse. And then there are completely online schools, so I take four of my classes at an online school and the other two I take at my local school. And one way I've seen students really engage with the curriculum in an <laughs> online setting is through discussion boards where students are required to post a response. And the great thing is that because participation in discussion boards is required, then the quieter students who might never speak up in class suddenly have an opportunity to make their voice heard. And I think these are tools that don't need to be limited just to online schools. They can be taken to um, a, a physical school as well with things like blogging and um, assignments that maybe make more use of online tools. So there are countless people who are using technology, many of them in this room, who are using technology to get students engaged and learning faster, smarter, better. By changing the way we think of teaching and learning, rethinking, realizing that learning doesn't just happen in the traditional modes of the direct lecture and the textbook reading and the worksheet answering, but also, and perhaps more effectively, with different approaches like flipped classrooms, blended learning, individual and group technology use, and collaborative problem solving, we can all have a part in the changing landscape of today's classrooms. But this question of where learning happens and showing that it does happen outside these traditional modes kind of begs the question, okay, so if it's not there, where does learning happen? 
Well, from the examples of technology, it can obviously happen outside of our traditional concepts of learning and teaching, but there are some other ways as well. I think we can rethink our ideas of where learning happens and recreate education to fit changing visions. I'm guessing that most of you would agree that at its heart, learning is about connections. Those are connections between me and the curriculum I'm learning, connections between me and the teacher who's helping me understand that. And one thing I highly promote is the concept of reciprocal learning, where it's not just the teacher um, teaching me, but also me teaching my teachers. This attitude that my students have something to teach me can come in especially handy when it comes to technology. I was talking with some great folks from the Arkansas, uh, Southwest Arkansas Education Cooperative, and they mentioned that a common misconception from teachers is the idea that you have to be a complete expert about the iPad or the Kindle or whatever you're bringing into the classroom before you can let a student touch it. You know, I have to know every bit of how this works, otherwise I'm going to be um, you know, shamed in front of my 30 students not knowing how to work a piece of technology. You have, to keep, you have to keep face and stay the expert. But this is a really aggravating myth because it's not the case. I mean, stand up if you've ever gotten tech support from someone younger than you. <laughs> I think most of the room is going to be on their feet pretty soon. Okay, I see a lot, I, a lot of people stood up, right? Well, it's not just that teachers don't need to force themselves to be experts. There can also be benefits to letting the students help teachers with technology. Um, in his article on traditional learning that I read yesterday, Kevin Honeycutt mentioned a great example of where his math teacher, Mr. Austin, brought in a digitor, uh, which was this newfangled device, and actually asked Kevin to help figure it out to be kind of the digitor technician for the class. And um, as and I want to um, quickly uh, quote the article, and he said, then he looked at me and asked, Kevin, can you explore this thing for me? Be in charge of the digitor. Um, and, oh, sorry, then he said something that shook my world, and that was how that was described. So, you can see how giving a student a chance to be in control of something, a chance to work something, and to be able to teach a teacher something can do more than just, you know, take a load off the teacher's shoulders, it can really help the student. Kevin went on to spend his hours after school figuring out the device, and as a result, probably as Mr. Austin intended, as he put in the article, getting really good at math. I highly recommend that you look up that complete post at his website because it's an excellent example of how technology has these wide-reaching impacts. I provided some amount of tech support on occasion myself um, to my mom who's sitting here, to my dad, and um, a great example is my dad was never, he was like the anti-technology in our house. He worked for Windows Mobile for a long time, but he hated cell phones, so, which would probably explain why I wasn't super happy with Microsoft. Um, so this is my dad, and I'm, so we managed to get him on Facebook, and he really loved it, and then I also set him up a website, and I'm happy to say I'm super proud of him. I heard um, David Sousa talk about STEAM. Well, I think my dad was the earliest proponent of it because I put STEM Learning Advocate in his website's header. He changed it to STEAM. I asked him, is that a typo? And he said, no, it's science, technology, um, what's the E? And then, yeah, sorry, my Rick Perry moment. Um, engineering, <laughs> science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And he said, no, the A is for arts. And so, yeah, he was an early proponent of that. And he really took to it. He's updating his website. As you can see, he's changing his time. He's doing Facebook and really using it uh, for education. And the funny thing is, is that my dad being online, it's not antisocial, it's actually equaling more in-person conversation because suddenly it, we're not just talking about you know, topics that are um, in, the, in the physical world, suddenly we can have conversations about, oh, did you see that thing that was on someone's Facebook wall? Did you know this picture I tagged? Stuff like that. And that's awesome because before he wasn't a part of this world and now he is and I think that that's something really valuable. If you need help adopting technology in the classroom with the teachers you're working with to provide professional development are all, well, I don't know how to learn this technology, I don't have the time to learn this technology, tell them, get your, get your students to do that then. When you compare today's technologies to older ones that have been adopted in schools, I think that the difference is now that many of the developing technologies shaping our world are really designed for individual consumption. If you take like an iPad or a Kindle, for example, sure, you can show a video off of it, but it's really designed more for one person. And that takes control away from the teacher. Instead of looking straight at the teacher, I'm looking at my screen. You can really see that effect in this picture where these students in the UK, I think, are looking at their computers. But to me, the number of students looking at their screens in this picture is actually a positive, not a negative. Because each student who's working on their presentation, who's looking at a screen, is engaged in, in, with learning. And isn't that the reason that you
would originally want a student to be looking at the teacher in the first place so that they would be learning. Now with a screen or with a computer or with the internet, whatever device or tool you choose to use, you can extend the hand of learning in every student's face, which um, I'm imagining like a big hand coming out of my Kindle, which is not a fun image, but it's really um, something that I think is good. If a teacher says, well, technology is so distracting, then ask if it's distracting in the right ways. Maybe it's distracting away from the front of the class, but if it's attracting us to learning, I think that's good. Don't you? The reason I find these technologies so awesome is not just because I can suddenly you know, do a lot of things really quick, um, find anything I want, it's because they're empowering. Empowering students to create content, to make, not just take. Google SketchUp to make 3D models of animal cells through biology, or um, the free audio recording software Audacity for making podcasts about current events with a social studies class. Camtasia Studio for my mini lesson on the Articles of Confederation. Um, free Zooming presentation software, presently that's what I'm using right now, for a visual journey through Paleolithic artworks for your art history class. Um, a great example comes from mathtrain.tv, which is all students making videos about math for their peers to learn from. I hope that you encourage teachers not just to use technology as a teaching tool, but really a learning tool. When students are able to take something, um, like for instance on mathtrain.tv, they're taking what they've learned about math and sharing it to help others. That's incredibly powerful. Teaching themselves, teaching their peers, and maybe just also teaching you. Learning from students isn't just limited to technology or content creation, however. I highly recommend gathering students for honest discussions asking what is the one thing you would do to change education or how would you, um, what would you do if you were a teacher to change your classroom experience. Students hear a lot of feedback from teachers, but most teachers don't have some sort of forum set up where we can reciprocate. I'm sure a lot of stuff might be give us less homework, but once you get through that, you'll find a lot of really meaningful comments. Um, I asked a question on Facebook about how um, teachers or how teachers should be evaluated and my friend Maya said, my favorite teachers had a good sense of humor, made the material relevant and engaging, uh, well informed about material, posed challenges, were reasonable, and um, didn't give ridiculously easy homework either. Riley said, good teachers offer engaging and informative content for all students while maintaining mutual respect between him or herself and his or her student. Accomplishing that harmony sounds easy enough, but with such variance in students' learning needs and personal interests, the balance is seldom achieved by any teacher. Therefore, the worth of the teacher is almost entirely dependent on the audience they're teaching, which I thought was a very interesting comment. And this is from um, 14 and 15 year olds. So, wouldn't you like to hear these sorts of responses from students? Don't you think that this could possibly help the teachers you work with see education um, in a different light? These answers didn't just help me, they also helped them because reflecting on your own educational experience makes you think more deeply when you walk into the classroom and you're analyzing it. Whether you agree with the diverse points of view that you're going to hear expressed from students or not, I think it's worthwhile asking the questions. Maybe your next professional development session with a group of teachers might be an excellent bring your son or daughter or grandson or daughter to work day as well. Get students in on the discussion. Um, Joan Schumann from Massachusetts, who you probably remember won the Justice Prentice Award yesterday, wrote pioneering legislation for Massachusetts in the 1970s that put a student on every regional advisory council on education, even up to the state level. And that truly gave students a vote and a voice. Involving students in the dialogue that you have with teachers and asking us serious questions about education not only gives you insights into how education is serving its customers, it also may lead to better student perceptions of the education system overall. Because right now, ask a student, what do you think of teachers and administrators of education? And the image that probably comes to mind is, oh, it's that bunch of adults that make us come to school every day. That's not a great image. By listening to students and giving us representation, you can change that to one that is more positive, inclusive, and inspiring. Utilizing existing technology, learning across mediums, flipped classrooms and blended learning, learning from students, students using technology for content creation, making student voice heard in classrooms, schools, school districts. We've covered a lot of topics, but if there's just one thing you walk away with today, hope it's not the beautiful silverware. Um, <laughs> I just love how serious everyone gets, it's like just one thing you walk away with. Um, yeah, well actually in all seriousness, if there is just one objective that you take away or one um, idea, it's that learning and teaching
teaching is truly a two-way street. But unlike on the real street, there's no driver's age requirement. I encourage each one of you to think about how you can take the best of both sides of the classroom, the teachers, the students, administrators, because it is only when we know how to learn that we really know how to lead. Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you for those challenging thoughts and helping us to explore our mindset of learning and to start to rethink, recreate, and redesign how we work. Thank you, Adora. That was wonderful. If I was texting, I would do the OMG thing, you know. <laughs> I would like to take this opportunity to thank